Welcome. Welcome to Hug Nation. Welcome to a moment of recalibration, a shared vibration, a chance to kind of get in touch with who our best selves are. Thank you for being here. My name is John Halcyon Stin. It is an honor and a privilege and a joy and a sparkle tornado to get to share this experience and this time and this chapter and this moment with you. If you're here live, sweet, welcome. Welcome to the chat room. Welcome to this broadcast. If you're here watching the archive, welcome to this shared intention. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for receiving it, amplifying it into the world. These love ripples cannot be stopped. Today's topic is about a naked man on the sidewalk. So last Monday, a week ago today, I was riding home from work on my fur-covered bike, as I am want to do. And I live very close, so it's not much of a ride. And, but as I'm a few blocks away, I see on the sidewalk a dude, like, face down on the sidewalk. And as I'm kind of riding by him, I realize... His pants are down to his knees. Pants and underwear. His ass is up. Face down, ass up. That's not the way you want to sit by a truck. Face down, ass up. That's not the way you sit by a truck. Okay, I'm making light of it, but... It was jarring. So I see a man face down, pants down, on the side of the road. A little context, we're about half a block to a block from the, the park where is kind of the, the hangout for the local homeless. And so I had this split second of like, whoa, not my problem. And then I had this thought of, that's not the kind of person I am. I'm the kind of person that would do something. I don't know what something is in this scenario, but I reluctantly, in some ways, it's like, oh, right, my job description as person who walks a righteous path, I gotta turn around. So I turn my bike around, I go back, and the guy's pretty big. Um, close to him I'm like hey buddy how's it going and he's like out and so I park my bike I'm like hey buddy how you doing you need some help you need some help like trying to be real loud really clear that I'm close to him I had this for a minute I had a thought like maybe it's a trap you know like maybe he's he's you know he's doing this to, to lure me in close and then I was like okay if 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 Somebody thought through this plan to lure people in to mug by pulling their pants down. That person should make a better plan that makes them less vulnerable. So, but anyways, it, I, I don't know. I'm not thinking straight. I don't normally see bare heinies on the pavement. So I'm a little like, you know, I'm nervous. I'm, I'm you know, a little heart beating fast. And, and I... So I'm like, hey, buddy, you know, you need some help? And he kind of is like, oh, it looks, he's, he's like, barely, he's trying to lift his head. And so I'm making the assumption that he's super drunk and he passed out. I don't know how his pants got down. A part of me was like, is he maybe like taking a shit on the side of the road and, and he fell over? Like, but I try to be like, okay, let's just, let's just be kind to this individual right now that could clearly use some help right now. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to help you pull your pants up, okay? I'm going to help you pull your pants up. And he's like, uh, and he kind of lifts his head up and he goes, apologize, apologize, I apologize. And that like totally hit me. Like, I think if he was just, like, totally out, 
or if he was just kind of like oblivious, like, oh, yeah, what? what is your problem? You know, like, that would have been fine. I totally would not have. I would just been like, all right, I'm helping this guy. Whatever, he's out of it. But his reaction was, this, like, shame. Like, he wasn't okay with this scenario. He was embarrassed. He was embarrassed that he was face down. He was embarrassed that he couldn't do anything about it. He was basically was face down, his pants down, and he... He just, he's, I mean, all he could say was, barely say it, is apologize, apologize. And so, I grab his underwear, and I grab his pants, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, let's, let's let me pull your pants up. And like pulling, pulling, and he's, you know, he's like trying to lift his hips up. He's trying to lift his hips so that I can get himself up. Finally, I do. I get his pants up, and there's no noticeable soiling that I can see or feel. And then I'm like, now what? He's still a guy pa passed out face down on the pavement. And uh, I left. I thought, like, I mean, like, he's, I can't pick him up, you know? Like, it's not like I can take him to, I don't know what I would do, you know? What, like, bring him to go get some food or, but I mean, I, so I left him there. And I rode home, which was about a block and a half away. And I was, like, shaken up. And I, first thing I did was wash my hands. And then I posted on Facebook that, that this thing that just happened. And there was a part of me that felt like I, I did a good thing. And then there was this other big part that said, you just left him there. Like, you did not. That's, that's not enough. And so I was on Facebook, and people were writing me these nice notes. Oh, you're such a Saint Halcyon, and 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 it's like, like, and I just didn't stop crying. And I think a lot of it had to do with that shame. And I kept hearing his voice saying, "I apologize," and I kept like thinking to myself, like, "Oh man, I apologize." And so after getting more and more of these nice comments, and the truth is, like, it was like the more nice things people said in the Facebook comments, the more I was like, I, 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 you have to. So I, I'm, this is no, like, I'm not okay. This is, I'm not following what the kind of person that I would want to be in the world right now. So. I grabbed some of my roommate's granola bars and some cash and I got back on my bike and, and went back to where he was. And as soon as I got around the corner, I could see the cop car and the ambulance. And the man was being wheeled into an ambulance you know, as I pulled up. And talked to the police briefly talked to the ambulance, uh, the, the paramedic, and you know, we talked about what condition was he in when you talked to him, and he said he's about the same, and he's gonna be okay. And, um, like, it didn't feel great. I still had, like, felt like in this bag that I had granola bars and money, like, to me, that was like, oh, that's gonna settle the score. If that, that's, I'll feel like I did, the, I did good if I get, and so part of me was like, should I, like, the cop was very much keeping me back, keeping me back like he was not, did not want me to be a part of this scenario. So I was like, should I, can I give this money to the paramedic to give to this man when he wakes up in the hospital? And I didn't. I, I just figured that, okay, I've got an extra couple bucks and some granola bars to give to the next person I see that could use a break. 
And so it was oddly un, unsatisfying. I had worked myself up to, to, to the, I had this new scenario, this new action that was going to make me feel like, okay, that's enough, and I didn't get to do that. But I was like, okay, at the same time, thank God I came back because now I know that he got medical care. I know that he didn't die out there on the ground in the cold. He didn't, you know, somebody else didn't come up to him and t do something to him or, you know, I, I don't know. But it was like, okay, there is a resolution here. It still sucks. I still hear his voice saying, apologize. I still know that, you know, it took me this period of time to find what I thought right action was, but it was, it, it was a important classroom, I think, for a lot of reasons. And let me, let me, let me before I, I ramble on too much, just say like, look, I would have done things different if it happened again. And not in the sense that I would have given him, like, after all the comments and talking to people who were, you know, nurses and things like that, if, if this was going to happen again, I would have just called probably 311, which is like a services number, or 911. I would have let professionals handle it. I made some assumptions about what his condition was, but some people pointed out, well, what if that was not the condition? What if he had a reaction to medication? Or what if he was out of medication? Or what if you know he was poisoned? I mean, there's, there's all these scenarios that could have happened where my assumption that sleeping it off in time was gonna, would solve it. I mean, he was face down, so I thought even if he pukes, you know, he's gonna, like, it'll be okay. But who am I to make that call? There are professionals, paramedics, police officers, that that's their job. One of the reasons why I did not call 911 and did not involve the authorities, one is because this was half a block from the, where the homeless hang out, and I kind of feel like this has gotta happen a lot. And the other thing is, the last time I was in this scenario, in San Diego during a first Saturdays one time, the location that we used to go to was pretty raw, and there was a guy who was passed out, sitting in his own feces, just like bad, bad shape. And we contacted a police officer who was nearby and said, hey, this guy looks like he needs help. And the police officer was like, ugh. You know, got rubber gloves and I mean in his defense that is a very natural reaction to saying hey there's a super drunk guy over here who might be dying all I know is that he is covered in his own feces so that was partly in my head and one reason why I felt like I should do something rather than just call the authorities but what it really comes down to, and I think like the, the, the big picture that I wanted to talk about today with this whole scenario, it's not necessarily about the right thing to do in this scenario. It's about the phenomenon or about the process that we all have to go through all the time about finding the path that we are at peace with. What is the sweet spot? of enough action, not too much action. We are surrounded by amazing things in the world, but also surrounded by things that can use help. There are, you know, homeless people right outside. There are environmental things that could use help. You know, if you drive a car, you know, you're, you're or use any manufactured product, you are contributing to emissions and, and so, each one of us has to find the, the, the decision path and the action path that is the sweet spot for us. And that shifts and changes as you grow and evolve and learn. You know, 10 years ago, I think I would have been okay with riding by a homeless man with his pants up. And I would have justified by saying his pants are down. He's probably covered in urine and poop. No way. It's not my job to deal with that. And in working with First Saturdays and Help the Homeless in the last you know, four years, I've had so many more interactions with people living on the street and 
that wall of separation is so much thinner for me now. And the difference between that man and myself is, is circumstantial. Um, and so that no longer, I would not feel comfortable if I rode by anymore. That would be too little in my current, my current sweet spot. Turns out that just pulling his pants up is too little as well because I felt later I wasn't I was unresolved I had I, I needed to do a little bit more before I was at the sweet spot, and I the, the key in the sweet spot is that if you do any less you feel guilty. If you do more, you make unnecessary sacrifice. You feel like a martyr. You. And so the key is, how can you make choices so that you still are in your joy zone? You still feel good. You don't feel like, oh, oh, poor world, oh, all, suck, all things suck. And you also feel like, oh, man, I should have done that. I've seen myself go through a process with that, with like recycling or with plastic bottles, um, where at one point I didn't care. My sweet spot was, I w my sweet spot 12 years ago was I was having such a hard time drinking water that I would order a case of small water bottles delivered via Vons, you know, dot com every week so, because having a, a new fresh water bottle around you know, multiple times a day helped me drink water and that was what was important, you know. And as I learned and grow, that sweet spot shifted and I no longer was comfortable per being a part of that much plastic creation, even if I recycled them. So now I rarely get purchased plastic water bottles. I use a re reusable. And it's not like, this is not a sacrifice for me anymore. This is just my sweet spot. It feels like this is the kind of person I am. This is how I make choices. If circumstances, like I was someplace where I was thirsty and I needed water, I, I would be a little uncomfortable. I would have to acknowledge that I'm adjusting my sweet spot a little bit. And, and I also recognize that even as I use this or as I'm drinking sparklets that was delivered via truck, you know, there is an element of, I'm, I could do more. I could do more. And so with this man that I found on the sidewalk, it was this very visceral, powerful opportunity to find the sweet spot, specifically because I didn't hit it right away. And I was at unrest and at unease. And I think the important lesson here for me is that the cost, if I, if I did not go back the second time, the spiritual, emotional cost would have been massive. I would have thought about it. It would have been that guilt loop. I would have, I would have had to do a whole practice of like letting go, be present, let go of that thought, let go of that guilt, let go of that feeling, let go of that, that story about what you should have done. It's way cheaper, way less energy to go like, what can I do to, hit, to get back into the sweet spot? And the, the reality is, even though I wasn't able to do it, just the action, just making a choice from that place is what cleared my conscience or allowed me to feel like again, ah, this is the kind of person I am in the world. I can now sleep good at night. I can not think about this anymore or relatively less than I would have if I was not at peace with it. And it really comes back to the same lesson of last week and every week. Be present, have integrity, align with love. In the hustle bustle of the moment, I, I left him there. And then once I got present, had integrity, meaning tune into the kind of person that I believe I am, the kind of tuning into the, the I am that is deeper than my ego. If I'm in integrity with that, then I did not, I did not act in the way that I wish I had. If I'm going to align with love, then I'm going to do more. Be present, have integrity, align with love. <gasps> now I know what I need to do. <sighs> I, 
I also kept thinking like, man, there's going to be a time when I am going to be, maybe lots of time, maybe it happened last weekend and I don't even remember, when I'm going to be face down with my pants down and I'm going to need your help. And I'd like to think that I can accept and receive that help without the depth of shame I felt from this man. So I will keep pulling people's pants up, contributing to my karmic bank account so that hopefully when I need my pants pulled up, I can just say, thank you. Thank you. So whether you metaphorically need your pants pulled up or whether you literally need your pants pulled up or you metaphorically have someone in your life that needs their pants pulled up, I think the same tuning in to the sweet spot concept still makes sense. Am I okay just doing this? interesting as I say this this that, wow this totally mirrors and maybe this is why I had an experience over the last weekend where I was in a deep conversation with a friend and some circumstances came up and my ride was leaving and I said you know can can we pick this up later and then I was like you know never mind I'll, t- I'll tell the, the my drive ride that I'm, to go without me and they're like no, no no just go just go you know we'll talk later and I was By the time I went back to have finished the conversation, my friend had left the event, presumably because of the dissatisfaction and the struggle that we start we're having a conversation about. And that, in that scenario, I struggled with guilt. I felt like I was not in the sweet spot. I did not go deep enough with someone that was important to me. I did not ask the questions. Or state live the mantra be present have integrity align with love I think that I got caught up in things and by the time I tuned back in and refound my friend he was gone and I was worried and I felt guilty and um, so whatever the pants that need pulling up are make sure that you also are not supposed to do something else and I guess all we can do is keep tuning in and asking so that we don't hear the echoing, haunting sounds of apologize. So thank you for letting me walk through that. Thank you for being you. There is no right answer. There's just our sweet spot. So thank you for seeking your sweet spot and making all the spots so much sweeter. Thank you. I love you. Let's have a hug. Grab yourself by the shoulders. Mm. Let's be grateful for this body. At once so fragile and so robust, so self-healing, so perfectly functioning. Thank you for this body, and thank you for the personalities, the self-identities, the roles that make it so fun as we live the adventures of this conscious life. But let's remember that deep beneath that physical shell and that emotional identity shell is our true self, that true self that is not separate from the man on the sidewalk, that is absolutely and profoundly connected to every other person and thing. And when we let that self shine through, the right choice, the right action, the path of love becomes simple, effortless, as natural as exhaling after an inhale. 
So let's take three breaths and just allow that flow of all things, that connection to all things. Let's just be a part of it as we breathe in and out three times, in through the nose, On behalf of Grandpa Caleb and all the love warriors, <laughs>